Glacier Bay National Park, Alaska is one of the most spectacular places on the planet. With its rocky coastlines, temperate rainforests, diverse wildlife, active glaciers, and 4,500 meter tall mountains, it draws in over 700,000 visitors each year. Impressive for such a remote location because there are no roads that lead to Glacier Bay. The only way to visit is by air or sea. Okay, so technically there's a road to the local town of Gustavus, but the only way you can get there is by plane or sea. 275 years ago, Glacier Bay was a dramatically different landscape. In 1750, the entire 12,950 square kilometer area was covered in glaciers, towering over 1,200 meters of solid ice at their face. It was then, all those years ago, that something incredible happened. The glaciers started to retreat back into the mountains. I said retreat, but really it's more like they race back. Grand Pacific Glacier, the largest at the time and credited for carving out the bay, receded 104 kilometers in 275 years, and it continues to recede to this day. What makes this story even more interesting is that 100 years before Glacier Bay was completely covered in ice, the southern portion of the bay was actually very habitable. This was home to the native Hunaklinkit until around 1680, when Grand Pacific Glacier suddenly moved south and pushed them out of their home, forcing them to settle south across Icy Strait. To better understand the bay in place of a glacier, or Sit et di Gai in Clinket, we need to understand what a glacier is, how they're formed, and the effect it has on the environment as it advances and recedes over time. What is a glacier exactly, and how does snow turn into a glacier? To start, glaciers do form from snow. This process is based on simple addition and subtraction. When more snow falls than melts, the snow begins to pack into deeper and deeper layers, eventually becoming so compressed that with the weight of the snow above it, the snow forms a solid block of ice that we call a glacier. Actually, according to the United States Geological Survey, glacier is a type of monomineralic rock due to its crystalline structure of H2O, so technically glaciers are rocks. The biggest question that usually comes from anyone asking about glaciers is why are glaciers blue? They have this incredibly gorgeous blue that has no match in nature. There's nothing like seeing that deep vivid blue up close, especially on a cloudy day where it feels like you're looking deep into the heart of a glacier. However, when you see ice, it's mostly clear and see-through, and snow is white, so where does this blue come from? Individual snowflakes reflect a lot of light, so they appear white because every wavelength is reflected back to you. Ice, on the other hand, tends to appear clear. Sometimes you see a little white along the surfaces, but if you've had a big enough chunk of ice, you would start to see it take on that bluish tint. This blue comes from the fact that ice actually absorbs all other wavelengths of light except blue, which is why we see that glacier blue. It's similar to a mirror, how the glass looks clear, but if you look at it from the side, it has that emerald green tint to it. Glaciers are exactly like this, but take it up a notch. You'll see some white on the glaciers as that ice has been exposed to air and maybe already a bit melted, but underneath that layer, you'll see the deep, vibrant glacier blue. The easiest way to see this is when a glacier calves or breaks off at the front, exposing a clean new layer underneath. Different glaciers have different hues due to their formations and purities. The deeper and denser the glaciers are, the more that blue will shine through. Now that we have the basics of what a glacier is, how does this form an entire bay? And the answer is water is really heavy. I mean, really, really heavy. One cubic meter of ice weighs about 917 kilograms. So a 30 meter tall column of glacier ice with a width and depth of one meter weighs an incredible 27,510 kilograms. It takes a lot of snow that makes glaciers, but where does this snow come from? Glacier Bay is uniquely situated to receive a ton of snow year round. With the Fairweather Mountains reaching up to 4,500 meters and only 19 kilometers from the ocean, it's one of the most dramatic close signs in the world. Being so close to the ocean allows the moist air to push up against the mountain range, forcing it up into the atmosphere, which quickly cools it down and condenses into snow at those higher altitudes. Glaciers tend to form high up in the mountains where snow is less likely to melt, and gravity then does what it does best. Slowly, or sometimes quickly, the glaciers start to slide down the mountain in the path of least resistance. With all that weight above and behind it, they start to carve in the mountainside as they move downhill, basically becoming a giant pestle and mortar grinding away at the mountain. And this does two things. It grinds down all the rocks and minerals of the mountain into ultra-fine particles, sometimes called glacial silt or rock flour, 
and it creates these deep sharp valleys that may eventually be called fjords if this deep cut valley meets the ocean. Completely unrelated, but one of the most famous fjords in New Zealand called Milford Sound is not technically a sound, but actually a fjord. The only reason it's still called Milford Sound is because James Cook thought it was a sound when he explored it back in 1773, and the name stuck. Although the technical definition of a sound is a small body of water connected to the ocean, so one could say that fjords are sounds, but not all sounds are fjords. Back to the glaciers. As the glacier carves out the mountain, that glacial till and silt has to go somewhere. So it's constantly getting pushed down the mountain, sometimes being left on the edges of the glacier on the mountainside, and that is referred to as moraine. Over time, the glaciers carve deeper and deeper into the earth, which creates those deep valleys. Sometimes these glaciers meet the ocean, and those glaciers are called tidewater glaciers. These are easily the most famous types of glaciers because witnessing the calving in person is an incredibly powerful experience. Watching a glacier with a face over 60 meters tall, and sometimes even more of that under the water, break off into these chunks the size of skyscrapers. Crashing into the ocean is something that is just unheard of until you see for yourself. And even then, the scale of it is not something that we're used to. First off, you don't want to be anywhere near when this happens. The amount of water displaced basically creates like mini tsunamis that could easily topple small boats. When viewing from a safe distance, you tend to be far enough away that by the time you hear it, it's already broken off and crashed into the water. And yes, you can hear it. Sometimes it's called white thunder. A calving glacier creates such an explosive sound that it does actually sound like thunder or a loud gunshot off in the distance. There's also this gentle, well, relatively gentle, cracking you can hear as the glacier moves and shifts around. When viewing in complete silence, that crunching and crackling sound feels kind of haunting, knowing what might come next. All of these features are part of and what makes Glacier Bay so special and unique of a place on this planet. Now that we understand the basics of glaciers, let's take a look at the history and how these glaciers formed the bay as we know it today. Well before Captain Vancouver explored Southeast Alaska in 1794, Clinkett were settled in the region and called the Glacier Bay area their homeland since time immemorial. Prior to 1750, when the glaciers were at their maximum, they were situated more than 16 kilometers north of what is now known as the entrance of the bay. The areas around current-day Rush Point and Bartlett Cove were inhabited by the Huna Clinket. Here, their culture grew and flourished as they lived in balance with their environment. One day, the glaciers began to quickly advance. There are stories from the Huna Clinket about the glaciers moving as fast as a dog could run. And this lines up with geological evidence of the glaciers' advancement around 1680s to 1750s. Their villages were completely destroyed, and they were forced into the surrounding areas such as present-day Huna south of Icy Strait. They made sure to keep their culture, practices, and traditions with them, telling stories of their homeland and of their return. When Captain Vancouver arrived at current-day Glacier Bay in 1794, all that was there was a giant wall of ice a few kilometers in from the entrance of the bay. Although it had started to recede, it was very different from just 100 years prior. With no way to traverse through the glaciers, maps of the area at the time just showed it as one large mountain range. It wasn't until 1879 when John Muir visited Glacier Bay for the first time with the help of Clinket guides that the bay started to look more like it does today. His writings and research put Glacier Bay on the map as a place of scientific discovery and wonder, capturing the magic of this uniquely untouched landscape in his writing and inspire many to preserve and study Glacier Bay, eventually paving the way to it becoming a national monument in 1925 and later a national park in 1980. Throughout this time as the glaciers retreated, the Huna Clinket had started to return to their homeland and found it completely different than what they had remembered in their stories and song. The areas that were once lush forests and grasslands were now barren, completely stripped away by the glaciers. Where there was once land, now was deep water carved out by the mass of ice. This, however, did not deter them. Instead, they adapted to their new way of life, setting up camps in the spring and summer to fish, hunt, and gather in their homeland once again. With Western interest in the area's resources, life became difficult for the Huna Klinket. In search of riches with furs and pelts, they brought disease and land claims that decimated native communities and pushed the Klinket even further into fewer larger communities. This was magnified even more by the preservation of land in 1925 as a national monument and 1980 when it became a national park. With these new rules and limitations in place, Huna Klinket traditions and practices faltered over time. It wasn't until 1995 when a memorandum was signed by the Huna Indian Association and the National Park Service 
where a working relationship began. Over the years, the Clinket became more active in their homeland. Berry pickings began, subsistent fishing returned, and recently in 2014, gold egg harvesting activities have returned as well. The erection of totem poles in Glacier Bay occurred, and for the first time in years, a Huna ancestor house, Huna Shukahit, was built in Glacier Bay. An incredible project between the Huna Indian Association and the National Park Service. The work isn't complete, and the two groups continue to solidify the relationship and coexist in Glacier Bay. There is a beautiful documentary on the National Park website covering this history called Healing Across the Waters, which is linked in the description. To this day, Glacier Bay remains an important place for scientific discovery. Due to the receding glaciers, scientists are able to study primary succession of life returning to the newly revealed landscape. It's the perfect place to research because you can travel back in time as you move down bay away from the glaciers. Seeing the change from bare rock to mosses, grasses, and the start of temperate rainforests in a single valley. One of the best ways to see this change in geography is through maps. Take this beautiful map published in 1801. It shows the current day Glacier Bay area completely blocked off as part of one vast mountain range. Compare that to this map of Glacier Bay in 1899 published by the United States Coast Survey. Much more detailed including glaciers and topography, you can see how in just 100 years from the previous map how far inland the glaciers have receded from the entrance of the bay. Before, when we were talking about how glaciers ground down everything in their way into fine glacial flour, it made it seem like nothing could survive it. However, if you look closely at this map, you'll see some islands in the middle of the path where the glaciers would have sat right on top of. Now, it is possible these islands weren't directly under the entire glacier, with most of it flowing around them, but the rounded features tell us that their makeup is that of a harder mineral, although still affected by the glaciers. We can see on this geological map of Alaska, published in 2016, some of the different geology across the Glacier Bay area. A large portion of it being sedimentary and igneous to the east, and as you move west, the classification switches over to a more metamorphic rock makeups into the Fairweather Mountains. Turning on the fault lines show how these metamorphic sections lie between these two large faults. Now, I'm no expert in geology, I just find this really fascinating. Getting back to the glaciers and their movement over time, Glacier Bay National Park has a great map with timelines of glaciers available. I merged these split maps into one to get a smoother picture across the bay. The first glacier we are going to look at is Grand Pacific, as it has the largest movement over time. Starting where it is today, you can see how the last 100 years or so have been relatively stable. Then, we start to see these huge jumps from 1907 to 1892, revealing Russell Island in 1880, and just 20 years before, moving about 20 miles down the bay receding about one mile per year. As we move south to the entrance of the bay, we can see where it was in 1794, about where Captain Vancouver would have seen it, and the maximum extent into Icy Strait. We can see Muir Glacier has receded well back into the Tekinsha Mountains, compared to when he himself would have first explored the bay in 1879. This image of Muir Glacier in 1941 was taken from about this point, shows the extent of the glacier with Riggs Glacier merging into it. Compare that to this image taken in the same spot in 2004, and Muir Glacier isn't even in the same picture, as it's receded a few miles around the corner of the valley. One last place I want to visit is this part of the bay up here by Reed Glacier. There was a great photo taken in 1900 showing the glacier positions at the time, showing Reed, Johns Hopkins, and Grand Pacific Glacier right next to each other before they would continue to recede to where they are today. I actually took a photo from right about here in 2022, looking towards Tar Inlet, which is where Grand Pacific is today, and there is not a glacier in sight. It can be hard to get an idea of the scale in such a landscape so vast until you get up close and realize how large these distances really are. Even large cruise ships are dwarfed by the scale of Glacier Bay. We talked a lot about glaciers grinding down the earth, but what happens to the land after a glacier disappears? A product of glaciers receding is isostatic rebound. Because glaciers are so heavy and massive, they literally compress down the earth over time. When these glaciers melt and recede, that land has the opportunity to bounce back, leading to places that are rising. Since the initial retreat of Grand Pacific Glacier 275 years ago, the land has rebounded more than 5.5 meters, some of the fastest measured isostatic rebound on the planet. This leads to a constant changing landscape that plants and wildlife must adapt to to survive. The land isn't the only thing affected by the glaciers. As they carve through the earth, areas below sea level are filled in by the ocean, leading to the bay as it is today. These waters can even reach over 400 meters deep in some places. Across the bay in southeast Alaska, most tend to be shocked at how close whales can get to shore. Unlike most places on the planet, the shoreline and fjords pretty much drop straight down. 
If you're standing on the shore next to a mountain in a fjord, just imagine that the mountain angle continues further down as if the water wasn't there, and that will give you a good idea how quickly and steep the waters can be. Something else you may have noticed about the water by glaciers is how dirty or muddy it looks. That's because you are seeing the runoff of silt from the glaciers being suspended in the water. There are also some situations where there's a unique divide in water that is due to the denser salt water not being able to mix with the cool, fresh glacier water. It may not look pretty, but this muddy, silty water from the glaciers provides some of the most productive waters on the planet. With the addition of this fresh water carrying silica, nitrogen, and phosphorus into the ocean, it becomes cloudy but productive. Of course, it doesn't stop there. To help assist with this distribution of said nutrients, the tides in Glacier Bay move an incredible amount of water. The average daily tide range is about 7.5 meters, which occurs twice a day, every day. This incredible tide range mixes these nutrients in a perfect environment for phytoplankton to thrive. And when phytoplankton thrive, zooplankton populations have a feeding boom, then small fish come to feed on the zooplankton, which attracts larger fish, whales, birds, seals, and sea lions. A complete energy cycle all in one place thanks to the glaciers. The ecosystem in Glacier Bay exists in a delicate balance where even small changes have big effects. For example, the heat wave in 2014 to 2016 led to a 58% decline in whale populations in the bay and a decline in newborn calves as well as an increase in malnourished whale sightings. The increase in temperature at this time affected the phytoplankton and zooplankton productivity across the bay, which led to a decrease in smaller bait fish numbers that the humpback whales rely on to feed throughout the summer. As temperatures continue to increase and heat wave severity becomes more common due to global warming, the effect it has on glaciers and wildlife is expected to intensify. Currently, about 95% of all glaciers in Alaska are receding, along with almost every glacier in Glacier Bay being part of that statistic with no expected change in sight. For centuries, Glacier Bay has been a beacon of beauty and scientific discovery as the perfect living laboratory. Geologists come to study the dynamic landscape, glaciologists to study the ever-changing glaciers, oceanographers to study the uniquely wild ocean, and biologists to study the multitude of plants and wildlife that call Glacier Bay home. I've personally been fortunate enough to spend time in the bay, and it really is one of the most magical places on the planet. It's absolutely gorgeous with its vast, untouched landscape that really makes you appreciate those few places left in the world that are truly wild. The more you learn about Glacier Bay, the more you appreciate the beauty that it has to offer. Anyone can look at photos of the mountains and the glaciers and say how beautiful Glacier Bay is, but having the knowledge and understanding of the world around you makes it that much more incredible. When you're paddling under steep cliffs, exploring shorelines next to towering mountains, listening to the crackling of glaciers off in the distance, and witnessing nature in its purest form all around you, it's this surreal feeling that in a way feels spiritual. I remember standing on that rocky beach, looking out into the snow-capped mountains, and finally feeling at home, knowing how fortunate I was to experience such a magical moment. Glacier Bay National Park is a perfect reminder of how such interconnected environments can be vulnerable to rapid change, and why we should do what we can to preserve this pristine wilderness for future generations. It's one of those places that, once you visit, it's impossible to not want to go back.